This webinar will provide a brief summary of the updates made for the 2021 Flexible Payment Design Manual. If you have any questions about our payment manuals, you're welcome to contact me, Mary Jane Hayden, at the email address shown here, and it'll also be on the final slide of this presentation. So this webinar will describe the changes that we made for the 2021 Flexible Payment Design Manual and also provide some of the rationalization behind those changes. So we updated the chapters shown here on this slide, chapters 2, 5, 6, and 7. Any chapter not listed here had no changes made from the previous version of the manual. Just to orient you when you're looking through the manual online, you can quickly tell where we've made a change by looking for the vertical lines on the side of the page. This indicates that an edit was made to the text adjacent to the line. I'll go over each of the changes made for the 2021 Flexible Payment Design Manual in this webinar, but for future reference, this is a good way of identifying updates in our manuals. Also within this webinar, you'll be seeing the marked up version of our changes as we go through them all. Just to explain the colors you'll see, red underlined text indicates new language that's been added, blue strike through text is a deletion, the teal double strike through is where we've moved existing language somewhere else in the document. And the purple double underlined text shows where that existing language was moved to. The first update I'm going to tell you about today is the clarification we made to the definition for reliability in section 2.2.1, which is the section that defines the variables in the Ashto design equation. We wanted to clarify something with reliability. For a given project, you should generally only select one reliability value. If we read the 1993 Ashto Guide for the Design of Payment Structures, we find a definition of reliability that states it is the probability that a payment section designed using the process, and the process meaning using the Ashto Design Equation, will perform satisfactorily over the traffic and environmental conditions for the design period. So this definition certainly supports the idea that there should be a single reliability for a project. The expectation of a road to perform as designed in a project should be the same across all paved surfaces, regardless of whether it was milled and resurfaced or if it was widened. We've seen some payment designs for projects that include resurfacing and widening, and they use two different reliabilities for the two different work types. But really, one reliability value would have been more appropriate for those designs. So since we've seen this on various projects, we thought it would be worth clarifying here in the manual. Now, having said that, there are certainly project-specific cases where it makes engineering sense to use two different reliabilities in the same project. An example of this could be a limited access road with ramps to an intersecting arterial road. So here it makes sense to use one reliability for the limited access road and another one for the arterial. So as always, just use good engineering judgment and document those decisions within your payment design package. Moving on to chapter five, the first change in this chapter is to table 5.6. We realized that there was an inconsistency here between the flexible manual and the standard specifications and the spec is correct. This is in regard to the applicability of the note stating to be used for widening three feet or less. This note should not apply to graded aggregate base so we simply deleted the symbol here in the table so the note no longer applies to graded aggregate base. And so now we're consistent with the standard specs. The next set of changes are in section 5.6.6, layer thickness. Earlier this year, there was a joint bulletin released by the construction office and the materials office that announced a new maximum allowable layer thickness of three inches for SP 12.5 mix. This change was already made to the standard specifications, so this update to the flexible manual is just to incorporate that change here in our routine update cycle. Also in section 5.6.6, we did a little bit of cleanup by removing some redundant language for overbuild. Chapter 7 of the flexible manual, which is the chapter on payment thickness design process for rehabilitation projects, already has a lengthy discussion on overbuild. So to remove this duplication of language, we deleted the text from chapter five and just referred to chapter seven instead. And the final updates to chapter five are shown here in table 5.11. These updates are a continued incorporation of the change to the maximum lift thickness of three inches for SP 12.5. We added examples of layer combinations for a three inch lift of SP 12.5. 
Also, in looking at this table, we thought it would be good to clarify that these values shown here are not intended to be your only layering options. This table is meant to aid you in your payment design, and if you happen to have a combination of layer thicknesses that are not specified in this table, that's okay. The only changes made to Chapter 6, which is the chapter on payment widening, was to the sample problem in Section 6.6. There were a lot of markups and it would be cumbersome to try and display it all on the screen for this webinar, so I'll just describe what we did. Originally, the problem statement used posted speed rather than design speed. However, most everything we do in design is based on design speed, and I believe that's what the intent was here. So we updated it to have a design speed of 65. Also, the original problem stated that FC5, Open Graded Friction Course, was to be used. However, as you can see in our friction course policy table from chapter four of the flexible manual, we only place dense graded friction courses, so FC 9.5 or 12.5, on our two lane flush shoulder roadways. So we corrected the type of friction course we call for in the example problem and also updated the subsequent calculations to reflect that change. Another thing we noticed about the problem statement is that it did not mention the addition of paved shoulders, even though the calculations included it. So we added a sentence to the problem statement saying that we're adding a five foot paved shoulder. After the calculations, there's some language that discusses constructability and this paragraph was rewritten for clarity. We thought it was important to make the point that you don't wanna have a pavement design for a width of one foot adjacent to a different pavement design for an additional five feet. Really, this needs to be one pavement design for a six foot width. Following that constructability language, we also updated the summary of the payment design to reflect the changes in the calculations, and we also updated figure 6.1 to match all of the changes made to the calculations. Moving on to chapter 7, uh, which is our chapter on pavement thickness design process for rehabilitation projects. The first change in this chapter is in section 7.3, where we discuss the dif different methods of obtaining the existing resilient modulus data. We've added a new method, which is the historic deflection testing data. We also added a new subsection to describe this, which is section 7.3.2, and we'll cover that in just a minute. Here we also added a good discussion on the difference between a resilient modulus value obtained in the lab versus one obtained in the field through deflection testing. The field resilient modulus value is generally higher than the lab resilient modulus value. This is due to the very different conditions that the two tests are performed under, and also there is additional compaction resulting from the construction of the road and that subsequent traffic loading that's applied through the life of the road, and the lab test just can't replicate that. So if you were to use a lab resilient modulus value on a rehab project, it would probably be a little over designed. For this reason, we recommend using the field resilient modulus for rehabilitation projects and the lab resilient modulus value for new construction or widening projects. As mentioned on the previous slide, we've introduced a new method for obtaining existing resilient modulus information. The State Materials Office has developed a GIS tool called the FWD dashboard, and it has our historic falling weight deflectometer test data. So when it's not feasible for you to get field resilient modulus information through field testing, this is the next best option. You can use this tool to find field resilient modulus values that were previously determined on nearby roads. This tool should be used in combination with the review of existing pavement thickness and performance, and as always, use good engineering judgment. I should also note that this tool is not yet available to people external to FDOT, uh, if you don't have an FDOT login credential, then you'll need to coordinate with your district payment design engineer to get the information for your project. We're working on this access issue, but we're just not quite there yet. But we didn't want that to hold us up from uh, having this as a tool for your use. In reviewing this chapter for the addition of the FWD dashboard, we looked at this section too. When this section was originally placed into the manual, it was intended to be used by local agencies that may not have the means to obtain field resilient modulus values. We wanted to provide another solution for the locals to still be able to get the information they needed for their resurfacing designs. But it was never clear that this section was meant to apply to local agencies, and so we added the first sentence to clarify that. 
Also, as we were reviewing this section with the State Materials Office, we noticed that the language here that referred us back to Table 5.1 to convert a design LBR value to a resilient modulus was not correct for this chapter. As previously noted, the field and lab resilient modulus values are different, so simply using the design LBR value, which is obtained through lab testing, is not recommended for rehabilitation design. There is a conversion that can be done, and Central Office or the State Materials Office staff can provide assistance with that. Sections 7.4.1 and 7.5.4 were both updated to address difficulties with field data collection in certain locations. 7.4.1, which is shown here, has been updated to state that deflection testing requests should not be made for ramps or frontage roads, and an explanation for this was also added beneath the bulleted list. Since ramps and frontage roads are both one way and typically fairly short in length, they present both logistical and safety challenges. And there are other ways to collect this data too. Typically, you can use the mainline resilient modulus data uh, for any adjacent ramp or frontage road. So we've added that guidance to the end of the paragraph here. On a similar note, we added a statement to section 7.5.4 saying that we don't recommend using multi-purpose survey vehicles to obtain cross slope information on ramps or frontage roads because of the logistics of running up and down ramps and frontage roads. However, if your project has safety concerns for collecting this data in the field using methods other than the multi-purpose survey vehicle, you should work with the State Materials Office on project-specific requests to collect this data. In section 7.8.2, which is the overbuild section, we added some language that was found in the chapter 5 section on overbuild that was not here, and we also added a little bit of language to match what is in the standard specifications. So this was just a little cleanup. And the final update in the Flexible Payment Design Manual is a clarification in the Payment Only Projects section here. In the second paragraph, we state that Payment Only Projects are only required to meet ADA requirements for curb ramps, but we previously didn't mention detectable warnings. This was an oversight, so we're adding it in this year. There may be some instances where you have detectable warnings without curb ramps, so we want to make sure those locations are covered in this statement too. An example would be a flush shoulder roadway with pedestrian facilities. Without curbing, you have no curb ramp, but you'll still need the detectable warnings. So this little addition will cover that scenario too. This concludes the webinar on the updates for the 2021 Flexible Payment Design Manual. If you have any questions about the manual, please feel free to contact me at the email address shown here. Thank you for listening.